Welcome to the Michael Shermer Show. I'm your host, Michael Shermer. My guest today is Suzanne O'Sullivan and her new book, The Sleeping Beauties and Other Stories of Mystery Illness. Suzanne is an Irish neurologist working in Britain. Her first book, Is It All in Your Head? True Stories of Imaginary Illness, which won the 2016 Welcome Book Prize and the Royal Society of Biology General Book Prize. She lives in London, and as you'll hear in the show, she travels quite a bit. Uh, what I like about her is that uh, when she investigates a uh, mysterious illness, these anomalous psychological experiences and phenomena that people have, she actually goes there to check out what the social environment is like, the physical environment, the people involved, and in uh, and surrounding the victims of these mysterious illnesses and so forth. So we get into uh, that, what that was like as a neurologist. I think of her as kind of an Oliver Sacks, uh, which I find very interesting because I study weird things. And a lot of weird things that people experience are explained by these anomalous psychological phenomena, which go by various names. Uh, let's see, conversion disorder, psychosomatic disorders, functional disorders, my, mass psychogenic illness, folk illness, mass hysteria, biopsychosocial disorders, psychogenic or sociogenic disorders, and her preferred term, functional neurological disorders or FNDs. So we go through uh, the various ones that she um, writes about in the book. Each chapter is a different example of this. She goes to Sweden uh, and finds these um, asylum seekers who have been declined uh, from these various uh, countries that they don't want to go back to and uh, find that they fall into these uh, mysterious sleeping disorders, not, not just for hours or days, but weeks, months, even years. Uh, and from there, she travels to Kazakhstan and uh, Cuba and Colombia, and uh, it's it's really quite the um, narrative story here about this. He, she even has a story about a woman who almost died of a broken heart. How does that happen? We also cover the diagnostic problem. How do you define one of these difficult to define disorders? Uh, and then the signal detection problem. How do you know if the set of symptoms represents a hit, a correct hit? That is to say. Um, it really is a disorder versus a false alarm that it's not. Um, and so we want to avoid, of course, both type 1 and type 2 errors and how difficult that can be in psychiatry in general, and particularly when you're dealing with these very unusual cases. And then toward the end, I push her on some um, other um, examples of this, rapid onset gender dysphoria, for example. Is that a kind of mass uh, hysteria? as Abigail Schreier thinks, or, or is she willing to go that far? We'll see. And, uh, and also the false memory syndrome, recovered memory syndrome, as it was called at the time in the 90s, that turned out to be a false memory syndrome, the satanic panic of the 1980s, and other examples of this. So it's a super interesting conversation, and if you appreciate the podcast and would like to support it, as always, you can go to skeptic.com slash donate. And it's a 501c3 nonprofit, Skeptic Society, so your donation is uh, tax deductible. And as always, we appreciate your support, and thanks for listening. So I'm going to start with reading a passage from your final chapter called Normal Behavior, <laughs> uh, which is a great title for what the rest of the book is about. Here's what you write. It is very difficult to either spot or talk openly about the cultural idioms within one's own society, partially because they are not recognized as such, but also because they are presented as biomechanical illnesses, and to say otherwise risks forcing something that is being hidden for a purpose into the open. I am a doctor trained in the Western medical tradition, Irish-born and living in London. These are the main cultural factors that influence my own health and illness beliefs and I'm indoctrinated to use that cultural language when talking about illness. Like many Western doctors, I medicalize feelings and behavior. People come to me so that I will do that for them, give them the medical explanation for their suffering. But in truth, I worry all the time that what I'm doing, faithful as it is to my training and welcome as it is to my patients, is wrong and potentially harmful. Oh boy. 
Uh, that's quite a statement. <laughs> so give us a little bit of background on how you became a medical doctor and how you, why you decided to specialize in neurology and what led yeah. you to studying these anomalous psychological phenomena. Yeah. So, I mean, I sort of applied for university when I was 16. So it was a real sort of like, what do you do? I'd love to tell people I did medicine because for, you know, wonderful humanitarian reasons. But the truth is that, um, you know, I studied medicine because I was good at science and there weren't, I went to a school that didn't have a lot of options. So I chose medicine for that reason, but fortunately it suited to me. I chose neurology because, I mean, as soon as I started practicing medicine, I mean, the brain does everything. You know, the brain, um, everything that we do when we're, when we're well is, is, is supported by the brain. And that means that it can go wrong in so many different ways that it's absolutely phenomenal. And that makes it a really interesting organ to work with because it really is like detective work, trying to figure out, you know, what's going wrong and why and trying to put together really strange symptoms to sort of make a theory as to where in the brain they may be arising. So it's just, I love the thought processes involved in neurology. But now I work very often with, you know, disorders that might once have been classed actually more in the psychiatric realm. So I work with people who have um, psychosomatic conditions. So in particular, seizures that are happening for um, more of a psychological cause than um, because of brain disease. Now, I, I got interested in that out of pure necessity. So every single neurologist who um, runs any sort of neurology clinic and sees lots of patients will see loads and loads and loads of people who have physical symptoms like seizures that they believe to be psychosomatic. And um, we're not really taught how to deal with them. And when I sort of had finished all the junior doctor training and I suddenly was responsible for people who suffered in that way. You know, the way medical training works is that you could, I could actually be well within my rights to say, I can't find a neurological disease, you can go home now, or you can go back to somebody else or go and see a different doctor. You're not my my type of patient. Um, but I found I couldn't do that. And that's where this sort of interest arose, yeah. Right. And you do more than that, though. You also travel the world. One of the things I like about your book is, each chapter is a different um, disorder or whatever we want to call it. We'll yeah. get to that in a minute. But you don't just research it online. You actually go yeah. to these places, uh, Sweden, yeah. Kazakhstan, Colombia, Texas. Yeah. Oh, my God, Texas. <laughs> I did an amazing and, uh, road trip around Texas. I really recommend Texas for a road trip to anyone who's looking for somewhere nice to visit. <laughs> it was amazing. It was good. <laughs> Right, but uh, the, the reason for you doing that is so you could really gather what the environment is like, not just the physical yeah. environment, but the social, cultural environment. Yeah, I mean, precisely, you know, you sort of read a, a piece from my book there where I say, you know, I am embedded in a very particular culture. You know, I'm Irish. I trained in university sort of affiliated hospitals. I work in London. You know, these are my sort of um, cultural influences, and um, for a long time, I've been dealing with people with psychosomatic conditions and using really the formulations that come from my medical teaching, which is similar to the teachings of a lot of sort of um, Western medical doctors, which would be, you know, if you see someone who has a psychosomatic symptom, ask them about stress or ask them about their childhood, ask them about their marriage. And, you know, these really very limited ways of explaining psychosomatic conditions and then I started reading about these outbreaks of strange illnesses all over the world, people with symptoms of very like my own patients, seizures, comas, um, sort of tick-like symptoms, loads of strange neurological phenomena. I see exactly the same thing in my patients, but these people had really different ways of explaining what was happening to them. And, you know, that really sort of made me realize how important that sort of social soup is to what's happening to a person. You know, when I see a seizure in London of a certain sort, I explain it according to the lives we live in London. But somebody with exactly the same seizure who lives in um, Nicaragua. So I, I went to Texas to visit the Mosquito people who are the indigenous people of Nicaragua. And I couldn't go to Nicaragua at the time, much as I would have liked to. Um, but a large number of Mosquito people live in, te in Texas. So I visited the mosquito people in Texas because they have seizures just like my patient's seizures, but they explain them entirely differently. 
They explain them based on their cultural beliefs. And they have a spiritual belief that illness can be caused by evil spirits. And they attributed these seizures, which they call greasy sickness, to evil spirits. And I think when we who live in a Western world or people like me who train in Western medicine hear things like evil spirits, we immediately think, oh, you know, superstition or we look down on this as some sort of um, kind of nonsense. Um, but actually, this, this um, illness, greasy sickness, makes complete sense within their culture and is just as sensible as our many beliefs that if we eat a certain kind of food that, you know, that that will, um, you know, we, people believe things like if they sit on a cold step or a hot radiator or, you know, that will produce a variety of different symptoms. Or if they go out with wet hair, that will produce symptoms. We all have illness beliefs that make sense within our culture. And I realized when I started spotting these people around the world who had what I would call a psychosomatic seizure in my clinic. They would call something else in their in their um, hometown, and I, I thought, well, there must be something to learn from that. So, for example, on that one with the mesquite uh, people, that their spiritual belief that the, these are satanic or or, mm -hmm. or evil spirits, what's the internal logic for them? Yeah, why is that rational in that context? Yeah. So they have a different sort of system of of illnesses than we do. So, I mean, we sort of, we, we have a very dualistic kind of approach. We say things are psychiatric or things are um, diseases um, outside of our control, etc. cetera. Um, they also believe that they believe in spirits, but hey, so do we. You know, um, you know many people subscribe to a religion. Our religions are just different to their religion, and their religion comes with evil spirits that can infect you. It's not any more irrational, you know, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in spirits, but if this is the belief system that one um, subscribes to, they believe that there are evil spirits and that evil spirits can infect you. Now, on the surface of it, that just looks a little like what's happening with these people if they have a spiritual belief. They believe it so strongly that they embody that belief and start expressing symptoms related to that belief. So they think the spirit infects them. And when that spirit infects them, they get a certain set of symptoms. And and um, it's just a little like believing that, you know, believing that you've eaten something poisoned and, fe and then feeling sick or believing you've been exposed to a virus and then experience the symptoms of that virus. But actually, then when you visit that community, it is actually a much more sophisticated process than that. It's not a simple matter of we have this superstition about illness and when a certain thing happens, we feel sick. It's actually a sort of a, a sophisticated tool that these communities use to express distress and ask for help. So young women in particular, when they're in a particular social circumstance that's uncomfortable for them, but it's difficult to talk about, they can express the distress of that circumstance as these seizures. So instead of having to sort of, you know, we'd all love to be rational all the time, wouldn't we? We'd all love to be able to say, hey, this is bothering me and, you know, I'd, uh, you know, I'd like a solution to it. These seizures come as an alternative to having to, to have that sort of uncomfortable um, sort of exposing conversation. They develop these greasy sickness seizures when they're in a certain social situation, particularly where they feel like they may perhaps be being socially exploited or preyed upon by older men. Um, they develop these seizures, and what the seizures say to the community is, um, I need help, I'm struggling, I'm suffering. And when the community see that cry for help, they gather um, the forces to support the woman who's affected. And they support her through ritual and just by being there. And that support makes the person better. So in a sense, you know, these people are doing what we all do, which is if you believe strongly enough that something will make you sick, it'll make you sick. But they're then harnessing that to use it as an expression of distress and to ask for help. And anthropologists who have studied this find it to be like a really sophisticated problem solving mechanism that the people use. Social problem solving and personal as well. Yeah, social and personal. And we all do that, sure. You know, there's a bit of that in all of us. You know, we sort of, you know, it's, we do it differently because we do it to fit with our own cultures. But, you know, we get headaches that, that necessitate us taking a day off work or 
we express our distress through physical symptoms too. But when we do it, we do it in a form that is socially appropriate within our culture. We can't go, you know, in London, you can't go to a doctor and have seizures and blame it on a spirit because that will elicit a particular sort of uh, drama. Um, so instead, we will express our distress in a way that will get the right sort of help for us. Yeah, I should point out uh, from where I sit, the Western world doesn't seem all that rational. I you know, published Skeptic Magazine. Here's our, our latest issue about the aliens among us. I mean, yeah. there are you know significant percentage of Americans who think that you know we're being visited by aliens, and that you know some percentage of those think they're abducted in the middle of the night. This yeah. always happens when they're asleep. You know, it's a, probably sleep paralysis is our explanation for it, but for them, it's a very real experience. Yeah. Uh, often involves a sexual component to it. So mm -hmm. obviously there's something mm -hmm. similar going on yeah. there. And um, we kind of pick and choose our... Yeah. Go ahead. No, I agree with you. I mean, I was going to say, you don't ha even have to look at... I mean, I think, yes, there certainly are people with extreme beliefs that seem sort of, you know, um, very strange. But I think even the small beliefs that, that everyone has within a community, you know, their illness beliefs like chicken soup makes you know, will cure a viral infection or, you know, like you don't have to look very far to find beliefs that aren't really substantiated. Um, so it's not, you know, I agree. I'm not, I don't mean to imply for a second that any, that everyone in London is rational and uh, sensible and, um, but it's, you know, we love to look at others, don't we? And say that others, are, um, their beliefs are all a little bit insane. Um, but even our own beliefs, and I include myself in that, I'm sure I've got lots of little hang-ups that are based on no actual facts whatsoever. Hard to see them in yourself. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. No, uh, yeah, as George Carlin said, tell people there's an invisible man in the sky that in, uh, created everything and, and cures illnesses and answers prayers, and they'll mm -hmm. believe you. Tell mm -hmm. them the paint is wet. They have to touch it. <laughs> so <laughs> people are very right. selective about the kinds of things they want evidence for. Yeah. And uh, I think of a lot of beliefs as kind of mythological in uh, like religious beliefs, you know, that Jesus died for your sins or was resurrected mm -hmm. or political beliefs that, you know, my party is the one true party and the other one, the other people are evil. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people just just glom onto those things as kind of what I call proxy truths. They, they stand mm -hmm. for something else. The point isn't whether it's true or not. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it would be difficult to to find empirical evidence that Jesus was raised from the dead or whatever, but that's not the point. You know, yeah. it's like, well, I'm a Catholic. This is what I believe. Uh, yeah. You know, the transubstantiation. Do you really believe the cracker and the wine becomes the body and blood of Christ? Yeah. I think if you push people on that hard enough, they'd have to say, well, you're missing the point. This isn't whether it's true or not is, you know, how do the molecules in the cracker transubstantiate? This is like a medieval debate about yeah. angels on the head of a pin you know that's yeah. beside the point for most people yeah i mean i think it's interesting because i suspect i'm more like-minded with with your beliefs but i'm i'm an atheist and i visited communities like the mosquito people who sort of they the very very religious people they're actually christians but they also have these other sort of belief that comes from their traditions as well um and they cure their seizures with um ritual and with prayer and I'm, there were other people I learned about, sort of people in young women in Guyana who also attributed their seizures to kind of mystical forces. When I when I met people like that, I found that the ritual and the prayer works. You know, you know, these people very often got better. And if you encounter people with very similar medical problems in London, in US, in major cities in the US. Um, you will find that the seizures very often don't get better, you know, and, and the sort of the outbreaks that I visited, like, for example, in South America, where young women were having seizures blamed on the HPV vaccine or um, sort of, you know, if, if you were relying heavily on Western medicine to make you better, you were less likely to do well than the people who had spiritual beliefs. And that really sort of obviously I don't I'm not going to extrapolate from that to suddenly changing my sort of religious beliefs. but. There's something to be learned from that when people get the right kind of, you know, that Western medicine can learn from that. If, if people get the right kind of support um, and there's something about ritual and there's something about listening to people and making them feel heard that makes them better, better than Western medicine. 
So I sort of came away thinking, you know, there was a lot to be said for the value of spiritual spiritual beliefs of these people. Yeah. Yeah, several years ago, my wife and I went down to Carlsbad, California, to join Deepak Chopra's Chopra mm-hmm. Center there for a long weekend. And, you know, it's a whole package thing. You know, as you know, Deepak is, is very much into holistic medicine. He's a Western-trained doctor, but he thinks there's more to it than that. And to me, a lot of the kind of ritual... Uh, behaviors we engaged in, the tea drinking and the yoga, the stretching, the mantras that we would you know, repeat over and over. Uh, it was it was a little bit like what you're talking about. And, and, you know, given the setting near the ocean, very posh, nice place, you know, how could you not feel better doing mm-hmm. these things? It's, it's kind yeah. of a whole package deal. And to, set, to ask, well, does it really work? It's like, well, if you feel better afterwards, then yeah, it worked Yeah, <laughs> to that extent. There's an argument for placebo. I mean, clearly these things are working because one believes in them. And clearly the placebo effect, which has been sort of well demonstrated to have a sort of benefit to to people with many medical problems. There's an argument for Western medical doctors employing the the placebo effect. You know, we're afraid to use it because it feels a little like we're tricking our patients. It feels a little like we're sort of, you know, pulling the wool over people's eyes. You know, but if things like this make people better, then there's an argument, I think, for considering whether we should be incorporating some of this into our practices a little. Yeah, I also wanted to to, to talk a little bit about when we talk about something as mental or psychological, (laughs) even in Western medicine, it it implies that we're still dualists, you know, Cartesian dualists, like there's this separation between body and mind. And yet most neuroscientists and neurologists that far as I know, are, are monists. They think it, you know, the yeah. words like mind and mental, psychological, these are just words to mm. describe what the brain is doing. And we know what the brain is doing. It's swapping these neurochemical transmitter substances mm-hmm. across synaptic gaps and so on and so forth. Here's what I, I wrote and tell me if uh, think about this. So saying that an effect was caused by something mental is really just saying that it was caused by the brain. So a sleeping illness or a twitching illness or a mass hysteria event or whatever is Mm. no different from saying that my brain caused my arm to move or Mm. serotonin caused me to fall asleep or Mm. oxytocin caused warm feelings for another person. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we're in a real, it's, it's so hard to sort of communicate these things without being a dualist because you're right, I mean, Every, everything you everything you think, everything you feel, it doesn't matter whether you're thinking I like that piece of chocolate or whatever. You know, it all it all there's something happening in your brain to reflect everything. So, you know, the sort of manifestations of when we talk psychological, we're just talking about functions of the mind. Um, and I, I agree with you that most new, neuroscientists now would would have a horror of um, talking, uh, you know, in a dualist way about one thing being mind and another thing being brain. Although I would say that, um, yes, they. I'm not sure that they practice as they preach always, because certainly in the UK, and I think it's it's still the case also in, in the US, you know, a lot of neurologists get no training at all in, in psychiatry or psychology, very little at least. And very often psychologists and um, psychiatrists work in one unit or hospital and neurologists work in a completely different hospital so we do talk the big talk i sometimes think but i'm not completely sure that we're very good at um sort of putting that talk into practice actually um but also we have to be it's a real move for neurology in the uk now is really moving in the direction of always emphasizing the biological changes that come with psychological things and i think that's super important because if you keep reminding people that this psychological thing is happening because of a neurochemical or neurotransmitter or, you know, uh, electrical change in your brain, then it becomes real to a person. But if you emphasize it too much, then you take away the sort of um, the social environmental thing that has potentially also very important. So, for example, in a lot of what we, we now call functional disorders in, in the UK, but psychosomatic disorders, you get a chemical change in your brain that stops your leg moving. And if you just present it that way to someone, say your leg isn't moving because a chemical change in your brain has sort of interrupted your ability to move your leg, that's 
that sounds so much like a disease that it becomes fatalistic to a patient, I feel. Whereas what you we still need to be able to remind people that in a functional or psychosomatic disorder, if you can't move your leg because there's a chemical change in your brain, it could be that that chemical change in your brain has occurred because of you're frightened to move your leg or because something social um, or environmental has happened to change your attitude to your leg and the attention you're paying to your leg. And, you know, so it's language defies this situation a little bit, to be honest, because if you overemphasize the biological, then you you take away from the behavior or the social circumstance that has created the biological. Um, if you oversense, if you overemphasize the social social side, then people forget there's biology involved. So it's it's a really delicate area, I think. Um, and I fear that the more we talk about brain changes in psychosomatic disorders, you know, what inspired this book for me was this group of children in Sweden who had resignation syndrome, so asylum seeking children who fall into a coma when they're facing deportation. So it's clearly a trauma induced state. And when I visited the children, they were in this coma. Everyone wanted to know what's happening in their brains, what's happening in their brains. That seemed to be detracting from their real problem, which is they were asylum seeking children who needed social support. So we have to sort of talk about the biology with the social and behavioral things that created the biology, or else we make people feel like they've, it's outside of their control. It's all in if it's chemicals that they can't change. It's delicate. It's hard to. Yeah, maybe that's too. Redu- maybe that's yeah. too reductionistic. Here's uh, here's what I wrote in the, my book, The Believing Brain, yeah. reflecting on my training as a Skinnerian uh, from Doug Navrick. Uh, we, we ran. We literally ran pigeons and, and rats in cages. Uh, this yeah. was in the 1970s. Uh, and so here's here's one of the things in that kind of Skinnerian behaviorist tradition. Um, here's what uh, what Doug writes about the Skinnerian philosophy. Quote, I reject mentalistic explanations of behavior. For example, attributing behavior to theoretical constructs that refer to internal states like understands, feels that, knows, gets it, figures out, wants, needs, believes, thinks, expects, pleasure, desire, etc. The reified concepts that students routinely use in their papers despite instructions that they could lose points for doing so. <laughs> But and yet we do have to talk. I mean, we have to yeah. use words to capture yeah. internal states somehow. Yeah. So I don't see anything wrong with with doing that. But yeah. it's probably good to remind ourselves once in a while not to reify the word as as a thing that's floating outside of the brain mm. itself or somehow. Yeah. And, and somehow I think it, it, we're intuitive dualists because you can't sense the brain working. It, yeah, to me, exactly. it feels like what I'm doing right this moment is there's thoughts floating around up there. So then the question becomes that you know the problem of of the mind body problem how do how do the thoughts cause the neurons to fire that make me raise my arm when I think I'm going to oh. raise my arm <laughs> how does yeah. that happen right I know Yes I hope you're not waiting to me for me to tell you the answer to that question because I'm not sure that <laughs> no, I know because there, no, <laughs> there is no answer <laughs> yeah, Exactly yeah. But yeah I mean that you're right I mean you know the great I see people with really profound um disabilities that have a kind of psychosomatic cause um, and like paralysis in their legs or seizures. And that's a real barrier to it is, first of all, the language is that, you know, if they're told it's psycho- psychological, you know, it's very, very hard to, to kind of marry that together with paralyzed legs, but also our, our struggle to understand the brain mechanisms, you know. So, yeah, I, I feel like the we're constantly in Western medicine changing the names of these things because we think if we can find the perfect name that everybody will say, oh, I get it now, you know, that's that's what it is. But unfortunately, you know, we changing the names doesn't um, help. I think we have to reconceptualize people's understanding of how their environments and their social sort of circumstances and their emotional well-being changes their physical well-being. And it's just such a normal thing. But people can't quite get past the, when I'm frightened, my heart rate goes quickly. They're grand with that. They're fine with that. But they can't really um, then follow the thought to the more extreme examples, which are really quite common. Some of the language issues here that you discuss in the book is some Mm -hmm. of the different 
um, labels that have been put on these phenomena you study, mm -hmm. uh, like back to Freudian conversion disorder and hysteria, uh, psychosomatic disorders, functional disorders, mass psychogenic mm -hmm. illness, MPI, folk illness, mass hysteria, mm -hmm. biopsychosocial disorders, psychogenic mm -hmm. or sociogenic mm -hmm. disorders, and if I'm reading you right, you prefer this one, functional neurological disorders, FND, yeah. functional yeah. neurological disorders. Do mm. you want to uh, riff on, uh, on the yeah. labeling problem and, and why I you mean, think that's the better one? You know what? I only think that's a better one because, it, you know, at the moment it's the one in common use and I want everyone to stop changing the name. So we yeah. have to just settle on something. Um, every name is problematic for one reason or another. Clearly, there's sort of we need to leave behind the hysterias, for example, and also the sort of, um, you know, uh, anything that has a pejorative, you know, some some things are seizures used to be called pseudo seizures. I mean, pseudo seizures, it's clearly suggesting that someone's sort of pretending or something is pretending to be something it isn't. So I, we do need to leave behind pejorative labels. Um, but I think what's happening now, I'd be happy if I was honest to settle with the term psychosomatic. I realize it's problematic. It's problematic in the large part because people associate anything prefixed by psycho with sort of some madness or craziness or um, they presume that to have a psychosomatic disorder, you have to have a psychiatric disorder in the terms of schizophrenia or depression, etc., which obviously we know isn't the case, but not everyone knows. So I understand why the term is problematic, but I don't actually believe there's a perfect term. So what's happened now in, in the UK is they've come up with this term functional neurological disorder. Well, I mean, that term has cleansed the mind and the social environment out of this disorder completely. It's essentially saying this is a purely brain disorder, um, which is very, very fatalistic and very, very sort of um, it denies that the mind is involved to such a degree that I would actually say it, it, it stigmatizes anything to do with the mind. It's, it distances itself so aggressively from anything psychological, social, um, environmental, behavioral, by making it sound like a pure brain disorder and therefore it sort of um, is, is quite a confusing term. The reason I now use it regularly is because it's become convention within the medical world I'm in now. And I don't want, I don't agree with, I think a lot of people realize the term's um, problematic and are thinking, oh, let's come up with another term. <laughs> um, you know, I've been a doctor since 1991. Um, I, and through the whole of the 20th century, the only thing that ever happened to functional disorders and psychosomatic disorders is that the name kept changing. Hysteria, conversion disorders, pseudo. So a whole hundred years Nothing happened except people tried to find a label that everyone wanted. And I now in the 21st century want to say, let's stop doing that. Let's now this is the beauty. I talked to a minute ago about the sort of greasy sickness, which is the disorder that affects mosquito indigenous people of Nicaragua and manifests as seizures. Greasy sickness literally transmi translates to mean crazy sickness. So the mosquito people of Nicaragua have no problem with this condition at all. They're quite happy for the condition to be called crazy sickness because they don't associate it with meaning that somebody is mad or it's not an, a stigmatized condition. So you can call it whatever you want. And I, I feel like that's where we need to go. We need to start improving people's understanding of the mind, body, social interaction so that we can call these disorders whatever we want. And it's only stigmatized because of all people don't understand what it means. Yeah, the psychologist Stephen Pinker calls this the euphemism treadmill. And we just yeah. keep changing the labels because the words become pejorative. Yeah. I mean, the word moron, you know, that's a pejorative now, but that used to just be a category in the IQ uh, list of IQ uh, oh, really? <laughs> spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and then, no. and then you know, retarded and then developmentally disabled. Yeah. When I was studying abnormal psychology, I think that was in the 80s, developmentally disabled. I don't yeah. know what they call it children now um yeah it, but i don't know if i don't know if you'll be successful because it, it may be inevitable language just uh, yeah. keeps evolving um as yeah. people use the words differently um let's talk about the um the diagnostic problem you you mentioned um 
this POTS, P-O-T-S, postural mm. orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Yeah. So people's heart rate suddenly goes up and so on. And so the mm. test for this is this tilt table. I guess they put them on a table yeah. and they tilt them until the yeah. heart rate increases. And, yeah. the, and the diagnostic uh, criteria is 30 beats per minute that your mm. heart goes up. Um, and if, and if, if it goes up by 29 beats per minute, you don't have it 30 yeah. beats per minute you do. And, yeah. and which sounds kind of crazy because yeah. heart rate measurement's not super perfect yeah. like that, but no. you have to draw the line somewhere. Yeah. And therein lies a big problem. And this is, you know, POTS is, is one example, but I mean, this, this doesn't just apply to psychosomatic disorders. This applies to blood pressure, cancer assessments. You know, a lot of people, I think people think that, um, you know, a disease is something that's absolute. You know, if, if I do a test and it comes back positive, you definitely have it. You know, and that certainly is the case for some things. But there is a class of illnesses that actually sort of are only categorized by you sort of being judged against what's considered normal and you being considered to be outside of normal. Well, I mean, what's considered normal? I mean, how do you decide that? Well, you decide it based on the average within your community and you decide it based on sort of common sense. Um, and the, the, the outcome of that is that, you know, every community will have a slightly different cutoff for normal and diff a slightly different idea for what normal is. And therefore, diseases are being, some diseases are being sort of decided by small groups of doctors, you know, in a room will say, well, what's the most sensible cutoff for this? And um, the nature of Western medicine is that we are very much encouraged to pick up as many diseases as possible, to not miss diseases. So if I'm going to decide what the cutoff, blood pressure cutoff or heart rate cutoff is between normal and abnormal, I, I will always err on the side of overdiagnosing because, um, you know what, I'm punished for missing things. Um, and also there's a lot of things that people assumed truths. Um, so people assume that picking up an illness at an earlier stage is always a good thing, um, which actually isn't necessarily the case. Um, so for many reasons, we're encouraged to classify things as abnormal more than normal. And the consequence is that um, we are increasingly sort of drawing people into medical labels. I mean, I used the example of renal failure in the book um, somebody reclassified renal failure by changing the sort of parameters of normal blood tests for renal failure. And suddenly like thousands and thousands and thousands of people who didn't think they had a medical problem were told that they were heading towards renal failure just because someone moved a, a dividing mark slightly to one side. Um, and that's what Western medicine does. That's our culture bound syndrome. You know, pharmaceutical companies encourage us to make medical diagnoses. Um, you know, people's desperate search for answers makes us more likely to overdiagnose things. It's easier for me to tell you a diagnosis than it is for me to say, listen, I, I think you're fine, go home, because a lot of people don't want to hear that. Um, so the consequence of trying to categorize disease um, and say what is normal is that we will be more inclined to, to include some normal people in our abnormal group than the other way around. And consequence of that is that you will notice that people have people now come to me with you know young people 20 year olds come to me and they've got 10 different diagnoses already at the age of 20 and you're just thinking well how could that be you know you'd want to be but it's becoming increasingly easy to get a label like depression autistic spectrum disorder adhd because it, these are the kind of disorders that are sort of open to interpretation of a doctor and society medicine, pharmaceutical companies are pushing us towards making those diagnoses more aggressively. And not only are you punished for missing, but you're incentivized to find more in, in terms of what insurance companies will cover. You got to yeah. put a label on it and they have yeah. a category of what they'll pay per label. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's worse actually in that, you know, I think I'm not sure how people in the States feel about the NHS. I, I'm a, per, you know, National Health Service in the UK where we sort of, you know, pay through our taxes so you can go to a doctor and pay nothing. Um, because we are, work with that system, so when my patients come and see me in my National Health Service clinics, um, I am very much not incentivized to make a diagnosis, you know, because I gain nothing. I, you know, I don't have to worry about insurance companies. I don't have to worry about 
who's going to pay for this, et cetera. Um, but actually, if you're working in a system where there are insurers in private medicine, you are much more at um, the mercy of a system that will give you labels um, because, um, you know, there's a lot more financial incentive there. Working for the National Health Service, I'm protected against ever having to worry about, you know, I'm paid nothing. If I see the patient 20 times or one time, I still get the same wage, you know, and I, I think there's a lot to be said for a system where your doctor isn't paid every time they see you and your doctor isn't paid every time they do tests. Yeah, indeed. Uh, that's a problem in the American system. Yeah, it's sort of a, um, I was thinking about it reading your book because you mentioned that uh, if you hear hoof prints outside your window, it's probably horses, not zebras. This is an idiom yeah. from medical school. Um, mm. And so what, what that reflects is the, the baseline rate, uh, uh, what you would expect based on what the yeah. background rate is of whatever mm. it is you're studying. So uh, you know, D Dan Con Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky famously showed how even medical doctors get it wrong. Like if there's a blip on the x-ray, a blob on the x-ray, uh, you know, and, and 1% and of women have breast, breast cancer, the test is 90% uh, effective, or I think it was, has a 5% false positive rate, something like that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, the calculation was that uh, the chances are you actually don't have breast cancer. Some, something like only a ten percent, uh, ten percent of women who have a positive test on a breast exam actually have breast cancer, whereas right. everybody who sees the problem laid out, including medical people, mm -hmm. say, "Well, it's a ninety percent chance that she has breast cancer." Mm -hmm. And Tversky and Kahneman showed that it's a base rate neglect problem. People don't. Mm -hmm people forget the 1%, chances yeah. are you don't have breast cancer, and regardless of uh, of the technology used to detect mm. it. So it's a signal detection problem, and mm. and the problem is, is we don't want to miss any, so we set yeah. the criteria low enough yeah. that any kind of blob is going to be uh, mm. said to be, well, that's cancer. Yeah. But that's not risk-free because the tests themselves, you get a biopsy mm. or whatever, is, is not risk-free and has consequences. Mm. The secondary consequences. Mm. And we've got to also remember that um, the test that we're doing now, so again, I, I qualified in medicine in 1991, and we, MRI scans were only just about beginning to enter sort of regular medical practice then. So in other words, pre the 1990s, we didn't even have a, a way of studying and looking at the inside of the body in detail in healthy people. And now we've got these scanners that can allow us to look at the minutia and look at how different we are on the outside. I mean, you know, loads of us also on the inside have it, cysts and, you know, little differences that when doctors see them on scans, we don't always know how to interpret them. So I think people really underestimate the harm of doing a scan. Um, because what we often want to do is we want to do a scan to prove that everything is okay. But what if we find one of those little, you know, dots that we can't explain? And I'll tell you what, we find them all the time. And we're working with new technology and we're working technology that's more sensitive and more sensitive. So, you know, I'm very much in favor of, you know, I think some people perceive good medicine as if I go to my doctor and I say, you know, I've got all of these symptoms and the doctor does lots of tests. They think, oh, that doctor's very thorough. And um, actually, I wouldn't I wouldn't be loving that doctor. I would say that you do you do you limit the tests to what is absolutely appropriate because the more tests you do, the more anxiety you're causing and the more likely you are to find one of these little unexplained, you know, UBOs, little white spots that you don't quite know what to make of. And you've just, what you were trying to do is help someone and you've just really made things more difficult for them. Yeah, I have an oncology uh, close friend who, who tells me that probably most of us have little tumors growing in our body that, that never grow into anything. They're just sitting there. Yeah, and it's only a problem if it you know, starts to spread and get too big. And that if yeah. you do these body scans, you might see half a dozen in there and think, oh, my God, I better, you know, do a, a biopsy. Well, yeah. have you ever seen the needles of the, well, you have, <laughs> of a biopsy yeah. needle? I mean, they're huge. Yeah. And I remember yeah. uh, I had a, a blood issue at some point and, you know, my, the, the doc goes, well, if, if you really want to know for sure, we, we'd have to puncture through into your, I think it was either my kidney or my liver. And she showed me the needle. I went, Oh, no, no, I'm not doing that. I'm sticking <laughs> yeah. that thing in my body. 
<laughs> I'll take my chances on the other diagnostic tool. Yeah, yeah. these not not risk free. So um, yeah, totally, yeah, yeah, and then it, it, you know, in, in general, it's even harder for the kinds of things you're dealing with because there isn't a good database of what the normal background rate is of say sleeping illnesses. You know, it's just yeah. they're so anomalous that you know you go into one of these communities and and yeah. you, you know what kind of background database do you have to compare it to? Not much. Yeah. Well, no, actually, I'm not sure that I actually think the sort of things I deal with, the, the beauty of dealing with neurological conditions is that the n- nervous system can be kind of tested in much more objective ways than say, let's say I had just a pain in my stomach, you know, no one can assess what that pain is like, or what that, but if somebody comes to you, and they're unconscious, or, you know, having seizures, or having unconscious spells, or they're paralyzed, the nervous system is really open to sort of objective testing in the sense that, you know, if someone is paralyzed in their legs, anatomy sort of creates certain patterns of weakness and patterns of muscle tension, patterns of reflex changes, depending on where the problem is in the body. So actually, when you sort of face people who are comatose or having seizures, etc., or things like paralysis or blindness, these really big disabilities of the nervous system, you, it's actually quite easy to tell the difference between what we call a functional or psychosomatic disorder and a um, sort of a, a brain, a mystery brain disease that you still haven't discovered yet. Because functional psychosomatic disorders, they tend not to obey anatomy. They're sort of anatomically impossible. You know, for example, you see someone who's profoundly blind, but all of their sort of eye reflexes, like their pupillary reflexes, are all intact. Well, you know, you're not going to be profoundly blind, but still able to have all these intact reflexes, for example. So the nervous system is easier to work with than psychosomatic conditions of other organs that cause things like pain. If I've got pain in my joints, you know, that's not measurable by anybody. But if I've got weakness in my legs, that can be objectively assessed. So, And also when you go to communities where people are having these sleeping sickness, it's pretty easy to figure out that something is psychosomatic because it simply doesn't obey anatomy. Um, and what was most striking to me actually was that, you know, I was visiting communities like mosquito people, indigenous people of, of um, Nicaragua, asylum-seeking families living in Sweden, um, people in upstate New York, people in South America. The overlap between their individual physical symptoms, between, overlap between each other and with my patients really just reminded me that biology is the same everywhere. You know, these seizures of greasy sickness that are caused by demons look exactly like the psychosomatic seizures that I see. The thing that differed, so it wasn't really hard to sort of, you know, I can look at videos of these seizures and I, it's, they're very recognizable for what they are. What differed was the story that led the people to the illness and the attributions and what they did about them. That was the fundamental difference between the people but actually figuring out what was wrong with people was quite easy because the nervous system is really open to sort of objective testing. So you go to Sweden, you're presented with these patients that are comatose. Uh, and how do you determine that there's nothing wrong with their brain? You actually did brain scans? Well, I don't. I didn't personally, but they have been extensively tested by Swedish yeah. doctors. So I have access to that information. Um, So first of all, I did examine some of the children when I was there. And um, again, there's sort of um, the sort of objective signs like their reflexes and their sort of response to stimuli are sort of um, very conflicting with their sort of inability to wake up. So they don't have any of the typical sort of reflex signs or lack of reflexes that you might see in someone in a coma. But, you know, I know what's wrong with them because their doctors, the Swedish doctors, have done extensive MRI imaging and brainwave tests and blood tests. You know, not each individual child hasn't been extensively investigated, but certainly all of the early cases um, were extensively investigated. And, you know, even in a child who appears to be profoundly comatose, you can show a waking pattern in the EEG. Um, So the sort of... um, the children aren't currently given um, much medical care or investigations, but it's certainly in the past, it's, they've been thoroughly sort of interrogated with medical investigations, and it was clear that this had a psychological cause. 
And you know that they're not malingering or faking because this goes on for months and they have to have feeding tubes and so on and no one would fake that. Yeah, well, I mean, someone probably would fake that, you know, if they could. Um, And I think that there have actually been a small number of cases in Sweden in the more recent years where children, when they go into adulthood, said that their parents told them to behave in this way. But I mean, that's not surprising because, you know, if in in any situation, whether you're looking at sort of, um, you know, there will always be people who take advantage of a situation. But we know from the majority of these children that when, especially in the earlier cases, that when they were admitted to hospital, in they were kept in intensive care units for periods of time or in psychiatric units where they were being observed. Um, it was it was clear that this condition was was uh, was outside of their control and there was no kind of fluctuation in it. I do know that in more recent years there have been you know people who have mimicked this condition and unfortunately what happens when someone jumps on the bandwagon of a condition like this is that everyone who went before them gets tarred with that same brush. But I think we can say categorically from the early um, the early people involved who were monitored that there was nothing at all to suggest that they were malingering. Okay, so then you look for certain patterns between or among the patients. In this case, these mm-hmm. are uh, girls from... Um, countries that are war torn, like Syria, uh, no one in the right mind would want to go back there. They, they have a decent yeah. life in Sweden. They apply for asylum and they're rejected. It seems like an obvious conclusion. They're going into these comatose like sleeping episodes yeah. because they don't want to go back to this hellhole yeah. of a country. That seems obvious enough. But yeah. as a counterfactual for causality, uh, what about asylum seekers? It, just say here in California, uh, that yeah. don't want to go back to Mexico or Central America because they're you know hellhole countries, and and I haven't read about any sleeping disorders here. No, and that says everything really about how how this is a kind of a a social phenomenon as much as it is a psychological form, phenomenon. You know, so our society shapes our expressions of distress, and our society shapes our sort of how we manifest. Um, you know how we explain physical symptoms comes from what we know and what we see in our in our communities. So if I get a, a upset stomach of some sort, you know, and I live in London, and you might you might say irritable bowel syndrome, but if you lived in Africa, you might say well a, a stomach parasite or something. You know, so we we explain what's happening to our bodies according to society we live in, and we also learn the most effective way to express distress according to the society we live in. The fact that this this resignation syndrome, as it's known, clusters so specifically amongst this single group of people tells you that there is something incredibly important in their sociocultural sort of environment that has created it. So it it only affects certain asylum seekers from certain countries, mostly Russian republics and also some um, very persecuted groups like the Yazidi people and the Uyghur Muslims. Um, But it doesn't affect those people in their countries of origin. And it doesn't affect those people if they come to the UK or if they go to France or they come to somewhere else. So it's a specific group of people only in Sweden. What's likely happening is these people are kind of embodying a narrative that they've heard in their community. So somewhere along the line, there is a story that is shared within the community of asylum seekers in Sweden. Perhaps one can't say how this enters the sort of um, community sort of narrative. It could enter them. Maybe they share the same um, journey from Syria to Sweden, or they certainly live in similar apartment blocks and um, have similar sort of uh, go to similar offices when they're applying to for asylum in Sweden. So they have a shared environment and this narrative enters the community. Now, the risk is that by putting it that way, I'm making it sound like they heard the story, so now they do the thing. But it's probably more likely that what's happening is they've heard the story that this illness can happen to people who are under the stress of deportation. So you face the stress of deportation and you suddenly get bodily changes, which would happen to any one of us. You know, if I suddenly had a stressful situation coming up, I'd probably get sort of, you know, dizziness or fast heart rate or shake in my hand. So stress changes your body. If you then know, notice those changes and there's a narrative within your community that says, you know, these sort of symptoms can be the um, 
the warning that you're going to go into a coma, then you start sort of noticing other symptoms and you start sort of embodying that prediction. So you think, oh no, I think I'm getting it now. In the same way that loads of us must have had when when COVID came around, we all thought, I mean, I at least thought I had it multiple times that I didn't have it. <laughs> but So you get those early sort of warning signs and then you begin looking out for new symptoms and then you begin sort of um, unconsciously acting out the the narrative that that you have learned within your community. But I think it says everything about this being a social phenomenon, that it doesn't affect people in California and it doesn't affect people in London, that it just affects this one community who have been exposed to it. Although I should say it's now spreading because now it's not just that community that's exposed to it. It's now moved to asylum-seeking communities in Australia and asylum-seeking communities in Greece. So once thing, oh, wow. uh, once a story enters the atmosphere, it will spread to other places. And that would certainly be enhanced by the internet. I presume that's mm. one way these things spread. So what you're yeah. saying is it's kind of a social contagion in which you yeah. could track a kind of social networking uh, model to see how it spreads, much like uh, Nicholas Christakis's work with social networks, how, for example, uh, pe- people that have weight problems mostly hang around with other people that have weight problems, smokers with smokers and so on. And and it kind of, fe- I think you called that looping, right? I forget whose theory that was, lo- uh, kind of a feedback loop. Yes, that's sort of Ian Hacking, um, the philosopher, talks about looping. And yes, it's a sort of, um, these things are, they can start off in a very simple way with a physical symptom that um, any one of us could get. But once you get a physical symptom, there is looping both internally physiologically and externally through your environment. So internal physiologically, you start getting these autonomic kind of activations um, of your nervous system, then you notice them. And once you notice them, you notice them more. And then you become more nervous and your body is activated even more. So you've got this physiological system that's kind of the more you notice, the more there is to notice, etc. But at the same time, in your external environment, things are also feeding into that loop because people are telling you what happens to, oh, if you've got that, you might go into this and or your doctors start doing tests that contribute to your anxiety. So there's one thing can sort of add to another and it just gradually cascades um, until someone ends up in, in chronic disability. So when you went to Kazakhstan, uh, people find a plausible physical explanation for the symptoms. In this case, I guess it was a former mine, uranium mining town. So yeah. it would be natural to yeah. think, well, maybe there's some radiation leakage yeah. left over. Well, I mean, that's the point, really, isn't it? Is that often the things we attribute our sort of um, illnesses to that are, are very sensible, I mean, within our communities. So we might not believe in evil spirits and duendes like mosquito people, but completely um, reasonable belief within their belief system. Um, People in Kazakhstan fell asleep, 133 people in one small town where only 300 people lived. When they started falling sort of inexplicably asleep, it was, they didn't have spiritual beliefs to sort of rely on to explain this. So they, they believed what made most sense within their environment. And that was that there was a uranium mine nearby. Um, Although actually many of the people the government and, and officials often blamed the uranium mine, although that was ruled out. People themselves had worked in the uranium mine for, for a large um, amount of their lives. They didn't actually believe so much it was a uranium mine. They believed they were being poisoned by the government and that this was a deliberate poisoning campaign by the government who were trying to drive them out of the town. But that, again, you know, in the context of a government that has a history of corruption in the context of the society in which these people live, you know, subterfuge from a government um, behaving sort of in a self-interested way was a perfectly reasonable belief. But like all of these psychosomatic conditions, the problem is that it made no biological sense. You know, that these people fell asleep. Um, you know, uranium mines, when they're active, can cause cancers and things. It's, I wouldn't want to live beside a uranium mine, but this particular uranium mine was closed down and they don't cause mystery sleeping sicknesses. And similarly, sort of the biology of these people's conditions when they were asleep were impossible. You know, they didn't, um, the, their sort of clinical examinations and their tests 
and didn't correlate with the brain disease. Yeah, and two more examples of that from your book, The Havana Syndrome in Cuba, and then The mm-hmm. Witches of Leroy, Leroy in New York, mm-hmm. these girls that yeah. were uh, much like the Salem witch trial uh, hysteria. Yeah. But there, of course, yeah. we're Americans, so we look for some physical cause. The case of Cuba, they uh, those yeah. Cubans, you know, influenced by the yeah. Russians and the KGB, they must yeah. have some new secret weapon, a sonic weapon. Yeah. We've been all over this in Skeptic since the, we first heard this story. In the case of New York, I love how you, you write, because I remember when this happened, when NBC did a story yeah. on it, and then Aaron Brockovich, the activist, got involved, and there must be a chemical spill. There must be somebody we can sue, mm-hmm. <laughs> the, mm-hmm. as the as Americans are wa- want to do. And uh, so they yeah. finally found a chemical spill from 40 years before. And that's got to be it, even though mm-hmm. why the chemical didn't influence boys or men or yeah. older women and, and so yeah. on. It made no sense. I mean, that's what's wonderful about some of these things is the leaps of logic that, that have to be made to cling to these beliefs. I mean, we talk about cognitive dissonance, you know, that sort of discomfort we have when our sort of strong beliefs are being sort of contradicted by the facts. And, you know, we our way some people's way of dealing with that is they sort of bend the facts to fit their beliefs. And there's so much of that going on in those stories. You know, instead of looking at the facts and kind of having to adjust your beliefs. People said, well, you know, in the case of Havana syndrome, as you say, I mean, you know, sonic weapons don't exist and they couldn't, po- they don't cause brain damage. And there's a hundred biological reasons why a sonic weapon is impossible. And yet you have people at the top of their careers and people of incredible importance who are sort of fighting beyond that, those absolute facts that cannot be changed and still believe absolutely in these sonic weapons. So it's 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 really, it's re- very, very difficult to change someone's mind on, one would like to think one can present a fact and say, well, you know, let's think of an alternative theory because this fact disputes your one. That doesn't seem to be working in either of those. Um, in upstate New York, actually, was the one case, so a group of teenage girls in a school developed tick-like symptoms and Tourette's. And it spread through the school and, and the ticks got bigger and bigger until they turned into seizures. And the rumor went around that it was due to a very old train crash. And that really exacerbated the situation. That was the one circumstance that I visited where I felt like the doctors really made a difference, that they were the people who made things better. They made a firm diagnosis with these young women of a conversion disorder, which is one of the more old fashioned names for a psychosomatic disorder. And then they 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 were firm in their diagnosis and they took the girls out of the media storm in so much as they could. And that seemed to bring that attack to an end. Whereas in Havana syndrome, you know, I hate to say it, but the doctors are doing the opposite. You know, they're sort of, um, they, they hung, they kind of pin their kind of colors to the mass very early saying this is a sonic weapon. And I fear that um, there's a lot of pride involved in kind of saying, okay, five years have passed now. Probably it isn't a sonic weapon. I think a lot of pride would have to be swallowed to get people out of that situation again. Yeah, definitely cognitive dissonance there. People don't change their mind. Mm-hmm. And the problem with, as you point out, with Western science and medicine in particular is to call it psychosomatic is mm-hmm. is somehow degrading it or, oh, it's all in your head or you're making it up. It doesn't really exist. Uh, that oh. feels like, you know, you're calling somebody a liar or, you know, you're you're mm-hmm. a malinger or, or you don't know what you're talking about. That's the problem. Yeah. I mean, if you look at some of the, the statements and things that were said by the doctors looking after the people who have Havana syndrome, they said things like these people are really sick. I can they're not acting. They're not faking. They're really suffering. So it, it cannot be psychosomatic. You know, so clearly those doctors think that psychosomatic means acting, faking and not being really sick. By saying those things to their patients, they were pretty much saying, you know, you're either pretending or someone's attacking you and therefore backing these poor people into a corner. Uh, If if psychosomatic symptoms had been given the same sort of level of respect as all of the alternatives, then people would have had a chance to consider all the alternatives and perhaps a chance to get better. but. They were sort of shamed into, you know, going for the long shot diagnosis, which was the sonic weapon attack, um, which is is terrible, really. We we need doctors to be better um, educated about what a psychosomatic disorder is and how to present it to your patient. 
So with selective perception and the confirmation bias, you can almost always find something in the environment if you're looking for it. So in the case of the Havana syndrome, there were the crickets, I think it was, with some background yeah. weird noise that yeah. was probably always there. You just don't notice okay. it until someone says, hey, sonic weapon. And it's like, oh, yeah. that's what that is. And then you notice it. Yeah. Totally. I mean, it's all those things we're dismissing all the time, both in our environment and in our bodies, that we dismiss because we've no reason to worry about them. You just need somebody to give you a reason to worry, and you will start noticing things that you didn't notice before. And think of the situation these diplomats were in. And when you read some of the accounts of what happened, you know, they kept being called to meetings and being told to hide behind walls if they heard anything. And um, they were told to sort of examine their bodies for symptoms. And, you know, at one stage they were told to the, go to the doctor if they had a symptom. They were later told to go to the doctor even if they didn't have a symptom. You know, I, I recall my own experience at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. You know, when it for us it was March um, 2020 when we were going into lockdown and it was terrifying. And we were being told to wear masks and wash our hands all the time and examine our bodies for symptoms you know, and I, I recall, you know, noticing lots of symptoms and feeling very unwell myself at that time and eventually just kind of relaxing into the pandemic and feeling better. Um, but, you know, imagine what it must have been like for people to be told they were under attack by a mystery weapon. It must have been terrifying. It must have produced so many physical changes, you know, just giving them loads of things to notice and worry about. Yeah, now that I'm in my mid-60s, I st I've been thinking for years about Alzheimer's and dementia. And so every time I forget where I put my <laughs> keys or whatever, I think, oh, is this it? <laughs> and uh, fortunately, you know hopefully what? not. Yeah. I think those sort of examples are really important because, um, you know, those are the tricks our brains play on us. And I think if people understood that it's kind of a feature of, of our normal existence, um, maybe it would be demystified a little bit. Yeah, the, the the joke response to that is is no, but if if you do find your keys and and you have no idea what keys are for, then you may have dementia, or Alzheimer's. You know, not not what where does this go, but what is this, right? Yeah, just other examples of this because it's so pr prevalent. Just in the the whole rigged election conspiracy theory. My next big book is on conspiracy theories, and almost all of them are grounded in some kind of evidence. Every they they all have evidence. Every conspiracy theorist I've ever met says that, you know, they have evidence that the flat earthers, yeah. you know, they have arguments and evidence, right? So, yeah. of course, the question is, what's the quality of that? But the, the problem is yeah. you can always find something. So like the rigged election conspiracy theory that Trump has been floating, still floating. Yeah. Uh, I'm yeah. still hearing stories about, you know, the, did you see the video of the people at three in the morning bringing in these boxes of ballots into the voting a, a place? It's like, well, yeah, I've seen those. So what? What, what, what do you know about how mail-in ballots are then collected from the different sources and then brought there. That takes like six, eight, ten hours. Yeah, it's probably going to be three in the morning. But but yeah. what do any of us know how any of this works? So they're just selecting, yeah. you know, there's that video. That's the proof of the conspiracy. Yeah. Um, we, did a, we did a funny uh, cover story of Skeptic years ago on uh, the shrinking penis mass hysteria in Asia. And I thought, yeah. what in the world is this about, you know? And then, so when you read it, this is Robert Bartholomew's research. He's yeah. big on, on the, this, these different yeah, uh, problems. So, the, and so here, what's the evidence of this? I mean, you can look down and see it's either there or it's not. It, well, it, it's not that it completely <laughs> falls off. It's that it shrinks. But I can tell you as a, as a guy, it does shrink. You know, you go <laughs> swimming in the pool, it's cold, it shrinks. <laughs> and I don't know if you know si the, si the television series Seinfeld, but they had a whole yeah. episode about this, how uh, George was interested in this woman and they were off uh, on this little vacation, the whole group of them, and they went swimming and she accidentally walked in on him when he was changing and she went, oh, and then left. And then he, th then the rest of the conversation is, do women understand that it shrinks? And and they're like, oh yeah, sure they do. Then they ask Elaine and she goes, it shrinks? <laughs> they're like, oh no. <laughs> you know, so there it's a small step to, you know, in, in the context yeah. of those Asian communities where this happened yeah. is that if there's a rumor going around that if it shrinks, it's about to fall off or there's some evil spirit that's going to, you know, lop off your your penis and so on. And all of a sudden you have this kind of mass hysteria about this or whatever term. Yeah, yeah. 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 That's it. All of these things, they have their basis in something, you know. Yeah, people, they don't come out of fresh air, these beliefs. Um, but uh, we also have the problem, of course, that people 
you know, when you talk about rigged elections and things, how, um, you know, communities now really can't tell the difference between an expert and a non-expert. And that, you know, that's mm-hmm. how sort of in upstate New York with the tick spreading, Aaron Brockovich's word seemed to take on. And by the way, I, I love the movie about Aaron Brockovich. I have nothing against her at all. But when she came to talk about medical things, you would think the doctor's word would be trusted above Aaron Brockovich. But because she was a celebrity, it seemed to work the other way around, you know. So yeah. that's a, I think that's something we as a society really need to figure out is how we teach people what an expert looks like. Yeah, and there the problem is you get clustering effects that randomness doesn't look random mm-hmm. in, to our intuition. It looks, uh, you know, clusters look like they're intentional mm-hmm. or they have some deeper cause. Mm-hmm. Again, you throw a, a bunch of pennies up in the ground in the air and they land on the ground. They're not perfectly evenly distributed. Stars in the sky mm-hmm. uh, in constellations, that's what randomness looks like. They're, they're clustered yeah. into into meaningful patterns and our brains mm-hmm. are well designed to, to pick out those yeah. patterns. And so uh, she may have been right about the one case with the chemical uh, contaminants yeah. and won her, I think she won a big yeah. lawsuit. Uh, but yeah. that doesn't always mean uh, that yeah. that's the, the explanation. Exactly. exactly. And I think that train crash in Leroy, by all accounts, I visited Leroy and I met a journalist who had visited that train, train crash site. And I think it, apparently it was, it was awful. You know, it was just, you know, there was a lot of debris and there was there was good reason to believe there'd been a significant chemical spill there. And that's what makes these stories so compelling is is that, you know, there was a train crash and there were chemicals in the soil. And perhaps if no one did anything about the chemicals, they would have caused a problem sometime. Um, so that's why these stories are so compelling. And the same in Havana. You know what? Subterfuge exists. And you know what? I'm sure the Russians are plotting lots of different sort of campaigns um, and that's what makes everything so un- so believable, is it makes a certain amount of sense. Yeah, you talked about Sybil in the book. We've tracked that whole mm-hmm. subject of multiple personality mm-hmm. disorders. Now I think it's disassociative disorder or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure it exists at all. Uh, that, I'm not sure. Because what do you mean by personality, right? I mean, what is personality? Yeah. These are just words we use. Yeah, I'm not convinced either. I have to say, I you know there maybe there is in some sort of in the psychiatric world some sort of you know where people are have you know I myself um, have different personalities with different people or you know what I mean. Um, you know, I'm sure that there are ways subtle differences, but the way it's presented in the media of someone being a child one day and an old man the next day. I have to say that uh, I doubt that ever existed myself, but. Um, you know, it is interesting to see how how the media can can really drive sort of um, new medical conditions, you know. Yeah. Pardon yeah, me. same thing with the satanic panic here in the 1980s, where there was yeah. a spread across America of uh, this belief that, there, you know, every town had a satanic cult in it. So anytime somebody finds like a dead cat that looks like it's been ripped apart, oh. probably by coyotes or dogs, you know, that was yeah. evidence and so on. And then finally, the FBI, I guess, got involved in lo- with local police departments and they couldn't find any examples. You know, it was just totally yeah. non-existent. And, yeah. uh, and then there was the McMartin preschool case. I don't know how much you know about this, yeah. but this was in Southern California here uh, in, um, I think it was Manhattan Beach. And this was a, a preschool, a private preschool uh, in which it was believed that um, they were molesting the children. And uh, Mm -hmm. this, before the OJ trial, this was the longest, most expensive trial in California history. It went on for, I don't know, three or four Mm -hmm. years. And these uh, Mm -hmm. preschool teachers and the owner uh, were in in prison for years and so on. And the more they talked to the children, and and this was the belief at the time that children would never make up crazy stories. Okay. And uh, and so the police would interrogate them. And and now this has thankfully been corrected with police interrogation yeah. techniques, but they would separate the children from their parents and put them in this yeah. room by themselves. These are like four-year-olds. Yeah. And say, yeah. okay, here's an anatomically correct doll. Show us where he touched you, and then we'll let you go see your mommy. Yeah. You know, of course, the kid's like, oh, yeah. he touched me there. Well, what else did he do? Oh, he did this, he did that. And they would just oh, make yeah. stuff up, you know. And, and, yeah. and the stories got ever more elaborate, like secret tunnels yeah. underneath the – preschool that you know went across the freeway and and then then they took trips out to catalina island 20 miles out in the middle of the day during the week with the parents just nearby what 
how could this even be? And, and, and but yeah. people believe that, you know, that kids would never make up stuff like that or imagine it or something. And it just started yeah. escalating until finally it just ended. Mm -hmm. and, and then one more example in the nineties was the a recovered memory movement that these mm -hmm. therapists were um, extracting so-called uh, 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 repressed memories of childhood sexual abuse. These of mostly adult women who didn't know they were sexually molested. They had current issues mm -hmm. of depression or weight loss or weight gain or sleep problems or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's kind of a laundry list of, of symptoms. If you have any of these mm -hmm. or a combination, you may have been molested as a child. And mm -hmm. the woman would, in the therapy session would say, well, no, I, I don't think I was. Well, it turns out that you not remembering is a symptom that you were molested. Yeah. So no yeah. evidence becomes evidence. Yeah. And this right. cascaded along for, you know, four or five years until the False Memory Syndrome mm -hmm. Foundation started to push back. And then some of these women started suing the therapist when they realized this never happened. And, and yeah. I mean, they ruined families. I mean, these... Uh, Fathers, mm -hmm. grandfathers, uncles, and so on were uh, were accused of uh, pretty mm -hmm. much the worst thing you can be accused of is being a child yeah. molester. Some of them even went mm -hmm. to prison. They were convicted in a court of law, mm -hmm. particularly here in California, uh, based on nothing more than a recovered memory as evidence. And mm -hmm. uh, these are all the examples I thought of from from reading yeah. your book uh, of these kind of very destructive yeah. side of of that. Yeah. I think people that think that these contagion. sort of phenomena. Yeah, people think these sort of um, occurrences and phenomena are rare, but once you start looking for all of these things, whether the sort that you're describing or the more m medical seizure-related things that I, I've been describing, they're everywhere. You can find these things, um, you know, the, the, it's, it's sort of actually a very common occurrence. These things like Havana syndrome or the tics in New York or whatever, um, you know, they're presented as strange things that are unprecedented that hardly ever happen and that we don't understand fully sure there's a lot of unanswered questions but they're anything but strange they're common and um, when I said about writing this book I had to find these sort of outbreaks and the, there was no problem finding them you know the, because they're at any point in time there is usually somewhere in the world where one of these sort of mass sociogenic illnesses are happening yeah I went to a Pentecostal church in the 90s when I was researching a book on religion. And, um, you know, so I, I kind of participated. I didn't identify myself. I just went. And then when the minister called people up for healing. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a Pentecostal thing, but this this is a wild yeah. experience. I mean, there's music yeah. and, and people are up and down and they're holding hands and they're singing and, yeah. and speaking in tongues and they're rolling around on the floor. And it, it's mm -hmm. really quite the quite the show. But so uh -huh. when he called us people up to be healed, he was kind of going down the line, and I was standing there with some other people, and I could kind of see as he as he approached somebody to touch them, you know, they were kind of getting mm -hmm. wobbly, like uh, I'm feeling mm -hmm. it, I'm feeling it. It's almost like a role playing, okay. a contagious role playing okay. thing. I I see what I'm supposed to do, and and they knew what was going to happen because the preacher had like two uh, big guys that would stand behind the person to catch them when they would fall over, so they didn't bang their head on mm -hmm. the floor. And, uh, and you, but you could kind of see them getting wobbly, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to fall over here. Of course, mm -hmm. I, I didn't because I could see what was happening, but, and I wasn't believing yeah. it. But I could see if you believed it, yeah. that contagious, if it was yeah. all the music and the singing and the whole atmosphere. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's the concept of hypnosis or suggestibility. I mean, suggestibility, you know, a lot of people are suggestible. And I think that, you know, we kind of, we mm -hmm. kind of have a tendency to look down on, on that as a, a, a characteristic of a person, but actually it's just a, some people are suggestible, some people aren't. I went to, a, I was at a medical meeting of neurologists and somebody who was doing a study on hypnosis said he was going to hypnotize everyone in the room. I guess it was about say 20 neurologists in the room. So natural born kind of skeptics. And um, so we were all hypnotized and it wasn't very fancy. They played a tape. So there wasn't any big show it was just like they played a tape. We listened to it. We had to hold our hands up and, you know, they said things like, oh, your hands are getting heavy, that sort of stuff. But at the end of it, they said um, later on when when you hear this noise and they banged on the desk a few times, they said, when you hear this noise, you'll scratch your nose. So then the hypnosis section of the day was over. We thought the experiment was done. And maybe half an hour later or whatever, someone banged on the desk. And I, I swear to God, 
at least a third of the room scratched their noses at that point and the other two thirds of the room just started laughing because we couldn't believe it was happening which you know and this so it essentially seemed very much that these people had been hypnotized or these people were clearly suggestible even in this highly un this very academic environment you know so su- suggestibility exists and um, I went to a conference of people talking about hypnosis and they said that, you know, the ability to be hypnotized, it's an ability. It's not a, you know, it tends to be presented as a sort of weakness or, you know, you're a bit of an idiot or you're a bit, um, you know, you're, you're kind of the weaker person if you're able to be hypnotized. But they were sort of presenting it as more, this is an ability, this is a talent, you know, rather than um, this is a sort of a weakness. But certainly in, in medicine, we could be harnessing that more also, um, that sort of suggestibility, because a lot of people I'm dealing with, suggestion has made them sick. So why shouldn't we find a, a way to make them better with the same mechanism? Yeah. Yeah, hypnosis, it's often described as an altered state of consciousness. I'm not sure mm-hmm. I agree with that because we don't know what consciousness oh. is, right? The hard problem of consciousness. So. Oh. Uh, what would an altered state of that be? It, or is but but it but the idea that it's just role playing that seems a little yeah. too simplistic also to me. You know when 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 people are hypnotized and then the person says under hypnosis the hypnotist says you you won't re- you won't know the number seven and then they'll mm-hmm. have you know they'll wake them up and say count and they'll go one two three four five six eight nine yeah. ten and everybody laughs yeah. and they're like why are you laughing yeah. and they have no idea they seem to have no idea yeah. that they missed yeah. the number seven. What is going on yeah. there? I mean, I really don't understand the mechanism, but um, I, I, I don't know. But it was very much like this day with the neurologist when they were scratching their noses. I mean, I think some people are just um, easily sort of um, just very suggestible. But how exactly that happens, I don't know. I'm not sure hypnosis is what we think about in popular culture, which is, you know, this sort of I don't, I'm not sure that it, it is any sort of altered state of consciousness. I saw this, um, there's a, a, a sort of, he call, calls himself a magician, but he often shows his, his methods called Darren Brown, uh, Darren Brown, who's a oh, UK, yeah, I, um, I don't know if he's in oh, the he's States. Great. He's great. He best. does amazing stuff. Like, he, he, I saw he did this thing where he got two sets of advertising executives and he, he asked them both to create an um, advertising campaign for a product. And uh, then, and they both, although they were completely kept separately, created exactly the same advertising campaign. And then he sh- he showed how he did it, which is basically he collected them from the airport or the train station, whatever. And for like an entire day in the lead up to telling them what they had to do, he was bombarding them with relevant images and sort of things to enter their unconscious to sort of craft this. Um, so I think there are all these things entering our unconscious and some people more so than others. And our brains play tricks on us. Do you know what it is? It's that most people think they've got more control over their bodies and their brains than they actually do. There's so much going on in the unconscious over which we have no control whatsoever. And when it kind of shows its ugly head, we're all super shocked, basically. <laughs> but that's how the brain works. The illusion of free will. The the useful yeah, exactly. fiction of free will. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Darren Brown is so good at that. Although I should point out yeah. that sometimes magicians uh, do more elaborate uh, things to make you think they're doing something very yeah. psychologically subtle, when in fact yeah. it's not that at all. Um, I've yeah. had magician friends of mine explain to me, for example, I'll just give one super simple yeah. example where, you know, pick a card, any card, you pick the card, yeah. you sign the card, whatever, you put it back in the deck. Well, it's a forced pick the way they, you know, they, they sort of finger where mm-hmm. it goes in the deck. They know yeah. where the card is. They're going to get the card, but then, yeah. but that's too easy. Uh, so they add layers. Like, okay, now I want you to think about the card. Bring, bring it up like to your forehead here, and then, yeah. and then look, look at my hand. Now, now watch my <laughs> hand. Watch, watch my yeah. hand. And they're looking at your <laughs> eyes. And I've heard people say, "Oh, I, I think he's reading my eye motion," and my eye motion <laughs> tells him it's the ace of clubs or whatever. It's like. No, he's not reading your eyes at all. Yeah. He already knows what the card is. This is kind of a misdirection <laughs> to make you think it's this. And, yeah. and they're always careful to say, I'm not saying it's paranormal. I'm just saying, it, you know, I'm using, uh, one of them put it, I'm using my five senses to give the appearance of a sixth sense. And then people yeah. are like, oh, yeah, he's got this special. No, 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure how Darren Brown does all his stuff. He is amazing, yeah. but he is amazing. Um, but there are some, yeah, of course, priming. We know priming works in some yeah. of these yeah. experiments, at least the, the few that have been replicated. <laughs> not all of them have been replicated. Uh, but uh, all right, uh, Susanna, let me see how far you're willing to go with me on this. Uh, rapid onset oh. gender dysphoria. My friend, uh, Carol Tavris, um, who reviewed your book yeah. very positively, um and uh, so i said uh you know i'm talking to, to suzanne well what, what should i ask her she said ask her about rapid mm-hmm. onset gender dysphoria because we're in the middle of one of these things and and the the, the debate mm-hmm. is is just, just for our listeners so these are not mm-hmm. uh, kids who since an early age of age four or five felt that they were in the wrong body a boy thinks he's a girl and vice versa and for most of their life, they've led these, uh, you know, the, the wrong, they've been in the wrong body, that kind of thing. We're not talking about that. We're talking about teenagers who at some point uh, decide at, you know, like in a very rapid period of time, maybe in a few weeks or a few months, that they, they are the wrong gender or the wrong sex, mm-hmm. whichever word. Anyway, so, you know, Abigail Schreier wrote this book about this, very controversial here. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, that she thinks it's a social contagion. These are mostly teenage mm-hmm. girls in, on social media influenced by their friends. And the trans thing is kind of a, mm-hmm. a cool thing to be. You get a lot of attention. Now, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, the pushback against that is, no, no. Uh, what What's happening is that society is becoming more open and liberal and tolerant. So more of these people are coming out of the closet, mm-hmm. much like gays or, mm-hmm. or, or maybe the autism um, diagnosis category has widened up and awareness of autism. Mm-hmm. So it looks like there's a spike in autism, but it's really more of a diagnostic tool in mm-hmm. which we know they were always there. Mm-hmm. Uh, give us your thoughts on that if you're so inclined. You know what? I'm not so inclined, Michael. I think that basically <laughs> okay. it's best for me. It's honestly best for me as a neurologist to make sure. So I might sort of comment on things that I see in the media and stuff, but if, if, I feel like as a neurologist, I'm not helping my patients if I draw too many more people into their fold with them. And, that you know, when I was writing this book, I I very deliberately, you know, there's all sorts of things, say historical things like um, laughing epidemics and dancing epidemics and various things. And what I decided when I was writing this book, because one of the things that was very harmful to a lot of these people is when you kind of, start shoving them all into one group and saying that they're all the same thing sort of thing. So I sort of made quite a deliberate decision to choose people who I would realistically be seeing in my clinic as a neurologist um, so that I knew that I was sort of, A, not disparaging them by comparing them to witches from the 17th century or diminishing their experience by comparing them to people they had nothing in common with. So I think I will decline to answer that question. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, yeah, my thoughts on it are that we we need more data. We need more information. It's a relatively new phenomenon culturally. I mean, the, 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 the kind of thing we're talking about and willing to study mm-hmm. and make it a national conversation. Mm-hmm. But, the, you know, again, what's the baseline rate? I, I think we don't know. And I think more information yeah. about that would then go a long ways to helping understand what may also be also happening the one thing I'd socially. Say, yeah. Also, if there was less anger around the area, it's, it's sort of, you know, it, it, sort of the amount of anger and upset around the area at the moment, it makes it very inflammatory. We need to be able to just talk sensibly. Um, and I don't feel that that's possible at the moment. No, it's very politicized. Oh my gosh. At least mm-hmm. here in America, it's, uh, I think in the UK mm-hmm. as well. Um, yeah, you can yeah. be, you know, subject to cancel culture and, and call the transphobe and so on. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's hard to have a conversation about it. We definitely have to get past that. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you about disassociation here. Um, here's what Carol wrote. She she loved your book and and um, and wrote a very positive review. And then, but uh, says that um, even I'll just read her last mm-hmm. passage there. Even O'Sullivan, however, cannot resist the allure of a biological explanation in the form of disassociation. Quote, a disconnection between memory, perception, and identity, which can create a variety of experiences, including feelings of depersonalization and symptoms such as blackouts, memory loss, and even disassociative psychosomatic seizures. Close quote. Mm -hmm. Disassociation, she says, occurs all the time as a way of keeping us from being overburdened with information. It explains distracted mind, wandering, dizziness under stress, forgetfulness on a bad day, 
Only the pathological version leads to psychiatric and physical illness, close quote. But any term that accounts for everything from forgetting where your keys are to having a psychosomatic seizure explains nothing. How does it deepen Mm. our understanding of everyday forgetfulness on a bad day to label it dissociation? Working memory capacity, which is limited, explains why we are not overburdened with information, whatever that means. Mm. What then Mm. do we learn about the physiology of psychosomatic seizures to say that they are caused by disassociation? Yeah, I mean, so the, the belief that, you know, first of all, what we're trying to really do is the big problem for patients who have something like seizures is is understanding how is it possible that um that you can um sort of be both being told your brain is awake but you're not aware of your surroundings or being told that your brain is functioning normally but you're having a seizure so really sort of as a medical community um we are trying to understand the mechanisms of these and at the moment the closest we can get to understanding the mechanism is to suggest that this is related to dissociation. Now, we don't fully understand the mechanism, but it, it likening some of these disorders to things that people can understand more in their everyday life, I find useful in trying to help people understand that the brain does these things. So I'm not suggesting I know exactly the mechanism for everything. What I'm trying to say to my patients is sometimes I... I'm deliberately listening to the news in order to, because I want to hear a particular report or a particular sports result or something. And I could listen to the news three times and miss it every time. And, you know, um, many psychologists attribute that sort of feeling to just the mind wandering or dissociation. Um, I want my patients to understand that these sort of things happen normally in life. So I'm not necessarily trying to sort of say to people who are forgetful on a bad day, anything to them what i'm trying to say is to my patients is that our brains play tricks on us and even people who are perfectly sound of mind and even people who are intelligent and even people who are trying their hardest to pay attention sometimes just keep wandering away and missing things and if that can happen to someone on a good day when you know that there's no particular sort of problem for them Imagine what can happen if you're facing certain certain um, provocations. So I, I think I kind of use those sort of comparisons really just because it's very, very difficult when you meet someone who's having a seizure, which is psychosomatic. It's very, very hard to explain to them that you believe them and that these things are sort of um, tricks of the mind and that they really happen. So I draw on these everyday experiences to try and normalize these phenomena for people but I accept that we don't fully understand that, so um, uh, you know, and that there's an awful lot more still to be understood. But I think sort of everyday examples are helpful to my patients because they realize, hey, yeah, that does happen to me. So maybe my brain is not as reliable as I think it is. This happens to me all the time. It happened to me yesterday when I was listening yeah. to your book. Um, I was oh, about four in. <laughs> Four hours into a, a a long bike ride, <laughs> listening to to you, yeah. and 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 then I, I would get distracted, and you'd say something important, and I'd hit the thirty seconds back on the on the yeah. iPhone, and the, it would go back, and then I'd miss it again. And I sometimes I was doing this like three or four times, like, "Come on, Shermer, get it, get this, listen to the sentence," and then my mind would wander, <laughs> thinking about something else. Oh no, I missed it again. Thirty seconds, thirty seconds. I think that's probably yeah. pretty normal. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. I mean, we're, you know, these things are normal. Um, but I think sometimes people really, you know, they, they think that they're when people are having blackouts and memory losses who come to a neurology clinic, they say, but I, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, there's nothing bothering me. And I'm trying really hard and I'm paying attention, but I'm still not remembering things. So you need these kind of normal examples to say, yeah, but like, that happens to me. And I know it's worse for you. And perhaps there are reasons it's worse for you. But it, it happens to everyone, and it's not meaning as a dismissal, but to say, hey, our brains are not reliable, and that's just what they do. <laughs> right. Well, Suzanne, I want to be mindful of your time. We'll be going an hour and a half. What's uh, what's next on your uh, research and travel and um, writing agenda? No, uh, I am uh, So I am going to write another book, but the question is about what? If you have any ideas, Michael, I'd be delighted to hear them <laughs> because I have not yet decided. I'm just coming out of the sort of uh, stress of this book. So hopefully I'll come up with an idea for the next one very soon. 
answer the mind body problem and explain consciousness. That's all. That's all you got to do. <laughs> no problem. It'll be out next year. No problem. Yeah. And when is your book out, Michael? Well, uh, oh, my conspiracy book will be out about a year. For, no, it's like next next August uh, or oh. so. Sooner the better, because conspiracy theories are becoming, as you've probably noticed, ever more central uh, to our uh, politics. Yeah. And, 